In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. First off, I, I, I didn't plan this, but I just wanted to call attention to the fact that uh, uh, um, uh, Judy Weinclaw, she probably doesn't remember, but it was pretty fortunate that she read today's epistle because they actually used that epistle at her mother's funeral about Tabitha, also known as Dorcas, and all of the, not, not the robes and clothing that she made, but I talk about all the, the blankets and crocheted, uh, uh, that's what you call it, right? Crochet? Yes. Crochet afghans and things that she made and how she, she loved to give those away to so many, so many people. So it was rather fortunate, kind of a happy coincidence. Anyways, we've been talking about uh, the Divine Liturgy and we've been stopping at all various points. And uh, uh, last week we talked about the, what happened right after the Gospel reading and the sermon. We talked about the litany of fervent supplication, our first opportunity to pray for those things that we specifically need in our life, not just in general, but the things that we key into personally. Then we also went into the, about the litany of the departed, uh, when that could be used, the litanies of the catechumens and departure of the catechumens and kicking people out of the church, which was commonplace in the old days, which we don't really practice anymore. And then we went into the, the Trubic hymn, and the other two hymns that couldn't be sung at that time, and the great entrance, and the bringing of the gifts, and, and, and all that, we brought all that out. So you're probably wondering, well, why is Father John not starting after the Trubic hymn? Why aren't we not having, stopping the liturgy right after the Trubic hymn? Well, we'll do that next week. But this week, we're backing up a little bit, because while all that was going on, everything that I talked about last week, while that was going on, we're actually doing something in the altar that, uh, that is, is, of, is of note and would be of interest and, uh, and actually goes to the historical context of the church. So uh, this is one of the times, this is one of the few, 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 few times when the advantage is not to be here in church and the people who are at home get a chance because I'm going to invite everybody now through the magic of television to come into the altar. Those of you that are here are just going to have to put up with this and you're going to have to go home and rewatch to see everything that I talk about inside of the altar. So those that are watching from home, come on in, and we'll enter into the altar. Here we are. We're in the altar. Um, uh, the most prominent thing in the altar, of course, is the altar table itself, which is oftentimes called the throne of God. Um, what's most notable upon it today is that from Pascha to the Eve of Ascension, the Plas Genitsa, the winding sheet, the Epitaphios, always sits on here so that's only for those 40 days from Pascha to the eve of ascension and then that's this would be taken off and you would just have the normal color on on here we talked about bringing the gospel in during the little entrance and they brought it in and they placed it onto the altar as if Christ were sitting on his throne Christ the word the word of God the gospels sitting upon the altar table itself there are other things that are on the altar table. There are communion, communion uh, um, uh, cloths. There are crosses. We have uh, one of the spears that we use to help in cutting up the, the bread. Um, also on the altar table always is what is known as the tabernacle, which is kind of a small church-like thing. And, and in many churches, it's, it's under glass. But inside of here is the reserved sacrament. So... Um, on Holy Thursday, besides, besides having communion, the priest also makes um, extra communion that is, that is, that is taken and, and dried. And uh, each little particle of bread is intincted with the blood and then dried. It's kept in a little receptacle inside these doors. And so when the priest has to go to the hospital or nursing home or to somebody's home to give them communion, he comes in here and he gets out the the communion that's already made uh, so he can go in an emergency situation give communion. Also on the altar table, some parishes have it inside of here also. We actually have a separate, separate receptacle for holy chrism. The holy chrism, the holy miron, the, the oil that we use for um, chrismation is kept inside of here. That's for baptisms or when people join the church. Um, behind the altar, per the Old Testament custom, is a seven branch candle stand and uh, traditionally nothing else is supposed to be on the altar table although 
It is somewhat common to also find two candles on the back of, of the altar. They're not originally called to be there, but it has crept in and it is, it is common. Um, we also, by concession, uh, right here, we have a very flattened out microphone, which, which helps uh, to, uh, to uh, um, project our voices for everything that goes on inside the altar so people outside can hear it on the speakers. So this is basically everything that's, that's kept on the altar. Now normally, right after the gospel reading, the gospel is, is put to the back of the, on the back side of the altar table. And because the, pl the plastidites or the epitaphios has this, this rigid um, uh, um, lettering on, it's not a very stable place to put the gospel because it can move. So a lot of times you'll see parishes or priests putting the gospel on the very back where it's much more stable. The thing I wanted to call your attention to today is this item right here, um, which inside of here is the Antimension. Um, and this is starting to be opened up right after, um, right after the, uh, the gospel is and the sermon are done. As the litany is going on, this is opened up. And you can see that all of these things are, are, are folded in a, with a, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's like nine panels that's folded, so it's kind of unfolded in a, in a crosswise fashion. This outer covering is called the Iliaton. Iliaton. And I, I don't, I don't, I've, I've looked, I've, I've researched, I can't find anything to, to actually find out what Iliaton in Greek means, other than there's an, there's an idea that it means that it stems from the word silk. And it just means kind of like a silken cover that protects the antimension. The antimension in Greek or antimens in Russian. And, and, uh, uh, and that is this piece of cloth, which when it's unfolded, reveals an iconographic, um, an iconographic uh, uh, image of Christ being taken down from the cross. You have... You have uh, angels worshiping, you have the myrrh-bearing women, you have uh, uh, Joseph and Nicodemus, uh, and the Christ's body, everybody taking down, there's, there's these uh, uh, vessels of myrrh. So it's kind of this whole image of Jesus Christ being taken down from the cross. That's always depicted in the middle of the Antimension. The Antimension, I, I should back up and say this, altar tables, um, event, when, when the church originally was worshiping and they were worshiping in houses they would just meet and gather and eat off of whatever table they had uh, eventually as as uh, as time wore on uh, and as the church was being persecuted and they couldn't meet in houses they used to meet in the cemeteries and it was common to meet on top of the the graves of the martyrs and so when churches when church, when the christian faith became free and able to build and, 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 and design their temples like the Temple of Jerusalem, they put in an altar table and, and in, in remembrance of celebrating liturgy on top of the relics, there's always relics that are inside of the table. Now, when a church is consecrated, originally the bishops with hammer and saw constructed the altar table on the spot and fastened it in place. My home parish in Minneapolis is like that. The original altar table is underneath and it's, it's fashioned there. And the altar table always has four pillars and a center pillar. And in the, in the center pillar is where the relics are stored. We have that here, although it was not our bishops and, and during the consecration, we didn't actually take hammer and saw to build it. It was already pre-built the top wasn't put on. So when it came time in remembrance of building the altar from scratch, the altar table was set here. Uh, the, we, took the, we put the relics inside and sealed them in. Then we took this top, we put the top on, and then the bishops and whoever else, there were four wooden pegs. We took stones and we, we hammered in the top of the altar table. Again, in remembrance of when the altar was actually physically built on the spot. 
So the altar table has relics in it. Well, this piece of cloth called the Antimincian literally in Greek means the uh, um, in pl basically in place of the table. In place of the table. So let's say that there was an earthquake and our church was destroyed. I could take this and celebrate liturgy on top of this wherever it might be. Uh, we could celebrate in the woods on a stump with this. We could celebrate with this on top of a rock. We could celebrate in a war zone. We could put this on top of a jeep and the, and the service could be celebrated uh, using this because it's like a portable altar table. It's, a, it's in place of the table. It's a portable altar table. And keeping in line with the idea that um, in each altar table there are relics, inside each Antimincian, you can see a little patch is sewn here and it's sealed with wax, there is a relic, a relic inside of this piece of cloth, which makes it in and of itself a holy relic, a holy thing. The relic that we have, I believe it's not listed on here, but I believe it's St. Herman of Alaska, uh, because they were, after we had our first American saint, they were using relics from St. Herman uh, uh, pretty often. Um, also depicted besides the, um, uh, the taking Christ down from the cross are the four evangelists in the corner. And then we have St. Basil the Great and St. John Chrysostom who are the writers of the liturgy that we celebrate. And then you have this lettering on here which I will read. And if you can zoom in, you can read too with me. It says, By the grace of the all holy, life-giving spirit, this Antimincian, this portable altar, the holy table is consecrated, offering on it of the body and blood of our Lord in the divine liturgy. And then down here, it says, with the blessing of the Holy Synod of the Autocephalous Orthodox Church in America, consecrated by the and it's unfortunately during the consecration process when they write in pen a lot of times and they bless it with holy water this happens a lot of times they don't pay attention and they smudge everything so it's actually smudged but it, I believe it says by the archbishop or bishop of Chicago in the year 1982 year of the incarnation of the son of God the month of and again, it's smeared a little bit. I think it says October uh, of St. Michael, Broadview Heights, Ohio. And then there's a smear. And then it says uh, uh, 1982, or 1982. And then it's signed with a cross, Boris, Bishop of Chicago. Now, the important thing about the Antimincian is that not only does it have a relic in it, and not only do we need this to celebrate liturgy, even though we have a relic inside the altar, we still use this um, on top of it. But the, the most important part, and I actually got in a huge argument with my, the with my pastoral theology professor, uh, Father Paul Laser, um, in my first year at the seminary, because... He taught us that the most important thing about the Antimincian is the bishop's signature. Because the bishop's signature is giving this parish permission in his absence for the priest to celebrate liturgy. And I couldn't get my head upon, around that. I kept thinking to myself, because I was always taught as a little boy that the relic was the most important thing. That you have to celebrate on top of a relic. And, and we went back and forth, back and forth. I think they were shocked that this first year student, this little punk of a kid, would, would put, up such a, put up such a ruckus in class. But I, kept, I, I can't believe that, I can't believe that. I, it took me a while to grasp that. It took me a while to grasp that, but again, you know, we're all young at one time and we don't always understand. And uh, sometimes we just hear one thing and we, we're, we're, we don't have the full knowledge. But the point is, is that the bishop is in charge of this church. He's the rector of this church. He's the overseer of this church, which is what episkopos in Greek means. So he's the one that's in charge. 
I'm in charge by virtue of he gives me the ability to be in charge in his absence. So I hereby speak for the bishop, so to speak. Um, and so uh, the bishop signature is there. Traditionally, every time we change a bishop, this should, be, this should be also be changed. In other words, after, after Bishop Boris retired, we should have had one by Archbishop Job. But Archbishop Job wasn't in the habit. He says, I don't like changing antimensian all the time because what happens when I go, you know, if I were to die in a year or two, well, he didn't die in a year or two. He was with us for a long time. But after he died, then we had Bishop Matthias, who was only here for a year or two, and now Bishop Paul. So, I mean, conceivably, this could change quite often. And uh, I guess just for continuity's sake, we've, we've, we've never petitioned to have a new one, although I think for our 100th anniversary, I'm going to ask uh, Archbishop Paul to give us a new Antimensian, so we'll be up to date. Um, and usually also... Um, written somewhere on here they would put down now they put down the name of the the saint that uh, is uh, uh, the relic that we have in the Antimensian so that's that's kind of a it's kind of our passport to celebrate liturgy and it's during this whole time prior to the Trubic hymn that the, 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 that it is unfolded and folded and and you always see the priest bow down and kiss the bishop's signature when the bishop is commemorated during the litany of fervent supplication. Uh, also inside, and a lot of people have asked about this because they saw me with this little triangle thing, they called it. But in the center, inside is a, is a sea sponge. And it's a regular sea sponge that you take and you take a, an iron and you, you take a regular sponge that is, is three-dimensional and you press on it and compress it with the heat so that it becomes kind of two-dimensional, but it's used kind of as a, it's used as kind of a tool to, to sweep crumbs or to put, or to put, help put the, 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 when the body and blood is, or the body is cut up into little particles to, to scoop or to help sweep those into the chalice. So it has a practical uh, a, pa a practical um, application and so there's always inside every Antimensian there's a small sea sponge uh, like this um, so that's that's what the the uh, the Antimensian is and if you get and if if you can't remember anything about it just remember it's in place of a table the Antimensian is in place of a table and it allows the clergy to celebrate liturgy wherever they might have to be um, or wherever they might have to go, uh, even if it's in somebody's house or down at Woodside or in our basement, if they were doing some renovations up here, we could celebrate as long as, wherever we are, as long as we had the Antimensian. So that's, uh, that's that, and we'll pick up next week with after the Truva Kim. So Christ is risen, and I apologize for somewhat ignoring you, but Christ is risen! Christos was crece, Christos in esti.